Good morning, everyone. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Gerald Taylor Aiken. Dr. Taylor Aiken is a research associate at the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research and also a Carson Research Fellow at the Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society. He holds a PhD in geography from the University of Durham, uh, which he completed in 2014 with a dissertation entitled The Production, Practice and Potential of Community in Any Brass Transition Town Network. This dissertation drew on qualitative, participative and empirical research with three of Edinburgh's transition town network groups and 18 of their initiatives in order to understand the role of community for these grassroots sustainability movements. Dr. Taylor Aiken has developed highly influential work on a transition network and his article, Community Transitions to Low Carbon Futures in a Transition Towns Network, published in, the geography, in geography Compass in 2014, has been cited over 120 times. You can find his work in journals such as Environment and Planning A, Energy Research and Social Science, Political Geography, Antipod, and Environment and Planning C. Last year, he published an article in Cultural Geographies, co-authored with Benedict Schmidt, called Transformative Mindfulness, the Role of Mind-Body Practices in Community-Based Activism, where he explores how practices of mindfulness are mobilized by environmental activists in Germany and the UK. His current research is focused on the role of community in a transition to low carbon futures, particularly how community is used to understand, value, and relate to the environment. And he's also currently working on a book that unfolds some of these issues. His talk today is called Community and Climate Justice, Why Orientation Matters. And I look forward to listening to his speech. So Gerald, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks for the introduction and um, for the opportunity to to give a talk like this. It's uh, it, as I was saying before, before everyone was let in, it's a real honour. So thank you very much for that. Um, I've been introduced, so I don't want to um, to reintroduce myself, but the um, you you will have got from that introduction that my research is all around um, community. I'm kind of obsessed with this social form of community, what it means, what it does, and particularly how it's put to use pursuing environmental aims and objectives. I want to um, it, give some examples of the types of communities that I'm talking about here. Um, and I will uh, then try what I'm, my kind of aim today is to chart a new way to understand these types of community initiatives like the Transition Town Network, uh, but there are many, many other examples of community that are available. And that's around this word orientation. Uh, so I want to try to uh, talk about what I mean by orientation, why it might be helpful, and, um, and the benefits that this, that this view can give both to the groups themselves, the communities themselves, but also for people like me, like a researcher who, 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 who tries to understand what's going on there. Okay, so at, at the start, I'll give two examples of the types of community that I'm talking about. Um, here is a picture, hopefully on your screen, um, which is, is an initiative called Benu. And it's a bit of a play on words on the English phrase, be new. It's a circular economy project uh, and Benu uh, repurposes, reuses fabrics, turns them into clothing and then sells them. It's a not-for-profit company. It's a social enterprise. So they, they will employ people in, in the initiative who will make some of the clothes. And then these new, new shirts or um, other items of clothing are then sold uh, but all through recycled material. So their whole central purpose is around no waste. Get it? That's their kind of entry point when it comes to uh, environmental issues is getting rid of waste. And circular economy the, is a phrase that they will use quite a lot. I've used this um, picture here, not of the new building as it is just now completely finished. This is from a few years ago when they were building it because what you're allowed to see through the work in progress building it is how the very material fabric of the building embodies these same principles. So they've got like old shipping containers there that they've used, some of which have been covered up, but you still see some there that they're about to, to cut open and use as the entrance point to a cafe, what's currently a cafe just now. And then behind and upstairs, they have got the actual factory where they make the clothing themselves. 
the windows are reused, so um, discarded windows that would have gone to waste, and everything in the building fabric itself has been repurposed, reused in some sort of sense. And this, although this is in Luxembourg, it's just in the south of Luxembourg, and uh, a few kilometers from where I'm speaking right now, uh, this is not your stereotypical view of Luxembourg as a very rich financial center. This is in the south, a post-industrial town uh, where they ha had a, the dominant economy of the steel, steel production. And actually a lot of Portuguese, I don't know, uh, maybe uh, you're aware of, sort of the connections between Portugal and Luxembourg. I certainly wasn't until I moved here. But Portuguese is a language you'll hear um, probably most often, more than any others, even though it's on the border with France and French is, is a very commonly spoken language in this particular city. So, the, so this is Benu, and then uh, the, the next picture is, a, a, is, a, is of the completed building, giving you the, their logo. This is the nice bird logo that's on each of the um, items of clothing that they sell. And the Benu, this new word, that, that, that's kind of a play on the English, um, English phrase, be new is there and you see these very quite artistic pretty mosaics that they that they do on the building and it's a, a very unusual type of building for uh, Luxembourg and for particularly this post-industrial town so there's a set sense of um, uh, embodying in the materiality itself of the building uh, a, a, a new uh, message of what community can achieve here so that's one particular example of community uh, there are many others, and here is another one. I'm only going to just talk about two at the start to give you a flavour of these types of initiatives. And this is a, a transition town initiative based in Esh in the south. So for those of you who know, I know some of you know the transition town movement quite, quite well. Um, some of you maybe are new to it, but for those who that means something, the transition branding, if you like, you can get a sense of what this group is group of citizens who live in that area have come together to do something environmentally. And here, there's no brand new materiality to the building itself. It's a rented uh, space in the, in the city centre. It was empty and they've used this space to create their own hub for their own community initiative. So you see in the bottom uh, right hand corner, there's a shop here and it sells very typical things for the types of shops that are created by these types of initiatives. So fair trade coffee, um, grounds, uh, you can get locally uh, produced uh, vegetables that you can pick up in this shop, uh, fair trade chocolate. Uh, there's no substantial difference to an, a normal supermarket, if you like, other than the profit principle is out. But the so, so, so we could say that this operates on a kind of green capitalist type type perspective. It's more ethical, but there's no embodied material difference to the setup of the shop or even the, the actual products themselves. They are still, still following the same types of supply chain, even if they are different supply chains that would otherwise be um, followed. So what is particularly novel or interesting about this? Well, it's not the material infrastructure. If you look at the top left-hand picture, it's the social infrastructure, because this hub also functions as a space where people can gather and meet together. And you see here is a, a kind of gathering or party type atmosphere. There was no uh, formal purpose to this organization, but they have it, they've used this space as a meeting space. You see right at the, I don't know how well the resolution is on your screen, but right at the back, there's a, and bookshelf and so they, they organize reading groups where people can educate themselves and learn more about the different issues that are um, that they are particularly concerned about. Uh, quite close to this in the city of Esh there's uh, other like-minded organizations like for example the Greenpeace, the National Hub of Greenpeace is, is quite close to here and so they will also come and use this space um, not necessarily officially, but just socially dropping in and using. And so you see that the, the less formal, more kind of social glue, the, the social ties that bind people one to another, the types of informal connections that can actually be the more important ones, can be forged and foistered in a space such as this. Okay, so these are two different types of initiatives. I could have picked many, many more. Um, but those two I've chosen because they seem to embody some of the variety of these types of community expressions. When we talk about the thing that I'm obsessed with, the ways in which community is used to do something environmentally, it can be as vague or general as 
having a reading group, sat around this table in the top picture, to actually reimagining and rebuilding whole buildings and changing the, the built infrastructure of cities. And community is used in all these different variety of ways. And I don't want to be exclusive and say there's only one particular type that I'm talking about here. Everything from the transition town, which is probably the most famous branding of these initiatives, to a whole host of others that I've not mentioned. We were just before we started, we were talking about Extinction Rebellion and all these other types of groups. So there's a whole range of groups, even including uh, state-based schemes that, that allow kind of neighborhoods to, to collectively reduce their, their carbon footprint. And we can be a lot more critical about the governmentality that lies behind that. But that also is included in community initiatives. Okay, so, so th there we are at the, at the start. We've got a, a setup of some of the types of initiatives and we can, and we can uh, have a, a, a material base to build from, if you like, for why do I think that this word orientation and what's going on behind it is important to, to think through when we're approaching these groups. Well, it's because how these groups have been most regularly understood is from a map-based perspective. So I'll explain what I mean by that. I, I, I'm a geographer, and so I like maps. I'm not being down on maps. And this is my own research here. This is a paper that we published last year. So I'm not trying to be down on other researchers. I'm very much including myself and the people I work with in the critique here. But this is kind of very standard type of research that we do. We, we have mapped the types of initiatives. So here we have six of the initiatives that are well-established enough. Two of them I've already talked about in the city of Esch. And so you see Esch in the south of Luxembourg, you see it in the border with France there on the map. So it's right, right on the edge of, um, of Luxembourg. But this type of map-based perspective, while that's helpful to have an idea of the types of initiatives that exist on the ground, the process of mapping can um, set up a type of expectation for these community groups that's actually antithetical to what these groups are actually doing on the ground themselves. So the process of mapping is distancing, it's objectifying. We are placing these initiatives on a, a, a we are locating them on the map. And that's great if you want to find them and know exactly where they exist in a topographic, topological space. Um, but it's less helpful for the types of social infrastructure that I was talking about with the second example there, uh, with Mesa, uh, where the, 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 it's the informal social reactions, the social glue that binds oneself to another. It's very hard to map that, and I would even go so far as to say that might be impossible. So this objectifying and rationalising of these types of initiatives um, is a kind of theoretical move that we've built on the top of the empirical examples. And I think that's the problem. Why is it a problem? So this particular paper that we published has this map in it that you can see on your screen. And we got some press coverage for it, which is great, you know, because normally when you're a researcher, it goes behind some paywall somewhere and you, it's dismissed. Um, but here we got, we got some coverage, which was really good. But then when it was published, this was the, out, the output. So this is in the Luxembourger Vort, which is the main central newspaper of Luxembourg. And you'll see in the background picture here, the, the building that I first talked about, the Benu. So you've got these very pretty mosaics and the windows in the completed building. And the headline that they chose, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the media coverage. I don't want to be too down on them, but the headline they chose was hipster potential. And I think in a, in a post-industrial landscape, this is not the stereotypical typical Luxembourg of the capital city, which is based on finance industries, very well, uh, uh, very well off, and where these types of initiatives exist, kind of bobo, chic type, uh, I would call this more hipster. This is, uh, you, you know, initiatives that are employing disabled people, people who would find it very hard to get into the job market. I don't want to be naively positive about them, but I certainly don't want to dismiss them either and say these people are just hipsters who are uh, only doing it for, for the kicks or for, or for an image. There's actually something more that's going on within these groups. Having done this ethnographic research with them, I, I feel like, oh, they're just hipsters. That's uh, there's something about that that I'm not quite um, comfortable with. And where I think that dismissive type approach, like writing them off as hipsters, these community initiatives come from, is tied up with this map-based objectification, distancing 
of these types of initiatives. And I'm much more, to, to use the geography metaphor, I'm much more interested in seeing these groups as a compass rather than a map. So what I mean by that is getting down on the ground, being within the group and seeing where they are orientated towards. What are the things that are pulling them in this direction or that? How do these people um, uh, relate to the territory that they find themselves on? And that compass perspective, I don't want to say we only need compasses met metaphorically rather than maps, but is, that, is so important to complement the map-based view, that, that on the ground sense of orientation. Where are they going? How do they want to get there? What are their hopes and dreams? Not necessarily where they are right now, because these groups can be really dissatisfied with where they are right now, especially in many of the topics that's talked about in this conference around the state of the world today. That, that is important, but where do they want to get to and how are they trying to chart their journey there? Um, I think orientation is a, is a great addition to have to this map-based perspective. Okay, I, I want to, to be more, a bit more theoretical now to, to that type of plea for compasses rather than maps and to show my working, here's a book that's been really influential for me in thinking through these ideas. So this is uh, Direction and Social Spatial Theory by Matthew Hanna, which came out, I think, two years ago. And reading this book has really opened up this uh, perspectives on orientation, a lot of it based on Buddhist type thinking, so the way that the self is orientated, but there's nothing against collectivizing that and using that for community groups themselves. How collectives are orientated towards certain goals um, or, or uh, objectives, ends and objectives. So I want to run through some of, the, um, some of the more theoretical implications of this. So as I said, compass rather than a map, um, that's the kind of, that's the take home message. If you're going to listen to anything I'm saying, that's the take home message for me, compass not map, uh, to, to replace one geographical analogy with another. Um, and how Matthew Hanna ex explains the importance of orientation is, orientation is, a, as he says, a non-contingent feature of human beings. So we are all orientated and we have to be orientated towards something. Um, this is a kind of the great insight of phenomenology from Husserl onwards is that uh, to be means to be towards something. The question is, what are you being towards? And I think we can talk about community groups like that in that way as well. They can be settled and static and happy with where they are or doing their thing or that is also a form of orientation or they can pursue something else like almost anything else why i find this really helpful is it helps according to hannah explain dark social matter and this for me is a great phrase i think i'm going to be coming back to dark social matter more and more often because that that type of inexplicable aspect to acting together with others in pursuit of, well, anything, but for my interest, environmental aims and objectives is very hard to rationalize, very hard to objectify and very hard to put down and to capture even in, in words, so even hard to, to verbal. And we'll all know this, there'll be certain groups that we are in that we just feel like we belong in. And it's not something we, we, we can necessarily find the words to describe. And so we use phrases like, oh, you just had to be there um, to, to describe a situation. And humor is often something that's like it's jokes. It can be very, as soon as you start explaining a joke, you've lost it. And I think a lot of what draws people to these community groups and initiatives is what Hannah calls dark social matter. Uh, so it's a problem for researchers like me who's trying to get to grips with that. But I think, think he's onto something in terms of describing it in that way. Um, and that, so I think this might help us find a productive theory of use for community, which is, gets us away from this objectifying map-based views that I think are tied up with the dismissal, both in uh, academic papers, so there's a whole range of literature around calling these types of initiatives post-political, for example, uh, but also in how these initiatives are received in the popular press and in policy, so they're kind of placing them somewhere and say, okay, you belong there. Uh, and that kind of limits their potential. A lot of this is based on um, a, a spatialization of left Heideggerian thought. So a lot of this goes back, and some of this, some of this in my own work, just to make a really theoretical point, goes back to Heidegger's distinction between Vorhanden and Zuhanden, and there's a whole uh, set of theories of being that's built up around this, and Hannah himself also belongs to this. I think it's interesting to compare that with how 
these groups are most commonly understood theoretically now, which is through a kind of post-Marxist, post-capitalist perspective, including fields of thought like degrowth. And there's a difference here between this more phenomenological perspective, the kind of Heideggerian, post-Heideggerian perspectives, and a more Marxist orientation. This is why I've been particularly keen to talk about the materiality of these groups at the start, because I think there's a way to overcome materializing dark social matter. It sounds like a contradiction, but that can be a way to not bring these two theories together or two theoretical perspectives together, but to allow them to at least be in conversation with one another. Um, so I think maybe that's something more in questions or if we were in person, we could talk about that um, more as well. And so the final point on this, on this slide is just to yeah, hammer home the message that direction is uh, as much as, as is, is more than being absorbed within a social group. Um, and it can be helpful to, um, to, to distinguish that from distance in a, in a Heidegger. So this taking apart distance is, a, is a, he a Heideggerian term. So if that means something to you, great. If not, that's fine. We're going to go back to the pictures. Um, okay. Um, so this is to really, uh, yeah, hammer, hammer home the message just as I finish the talk, is this distancing, objectifying viewpoint and why this is problematic, because it's not just this one journalist who wrote a newspaper article that I've got beef with, it's, I don't mean, to, this is pervasive to the whole field of community low carbon transitions. On your screen is a lot of text, I know, I'm, I'm sorry for doing that, but this is, this really gets across the point, the fact there's too much te text almost makes the point, which is that, um, there, there can be uh, death by objectification for these particular community groups, and it can kill a lot of that dark social matter. And um, this is not from Luxembourg, just to be clear. This is from commun the community groups I looked at during my PhD that Antonio talked about in Scotland. But it almost again shows that the pervasiveness with which these factors um, exist. So here in the document, we have what the community groups had to do to be legitimate, to be allowed to exist. They were given quite generous funding from the Scottish government at that time, but they, they had to go through these hopes. They had hoops, they had to uh, get a bank account, they had to nominate a treasurer, they had to make everyone's role, on certainly in the board, quite official. Everyone had to have a title. They had to um, get a constitution and write down the objectives. I mean, it's an interesting, um, relationship between objectification and objective in terms of how that works, certainly in English. And this is, is a different way of being to getting to, at least in theory, the transition time movement is about getting together and doing something. It's about action, being involved. But this more distancing, objectification, is more of that map-based thinking that I was talking about rather than the compass-based. So that's a very common uh, um, uh, stage that these community groups often go through uh, this type of document on the screen. The next one is even more extreme, I'm sorry to say, but this is what these groups had to do. This is an extreme example, but they had to, uh, the amount of work that they had to put in to demonstrate what they were doing environmentally. This is from the handbook that these community groups had. Now, I've got a PhD. I, I find this really difficult for me to do. Dealing with kilowatt hours and these types of formulas and equations selects who the type of people who can participate in these types of initiatives can be. Um, and so there's a, a real a breaking of the dark social matter that Hannah described, and a, a instead a reconfiguring that around um, nameable, describable objectives. And that changes the form of social being, um, being in common and uh, being towards certain ends and objectives. And so I think that this map-based view is much more per persuasive than just me writing a paper that includes a map. I think this is something that we can use to diagnose in general, the field of community as it's, as it's used to pursue low carbon transitions. So my plea at the end of this talk is that we focus, yes, we use maps, they can be very helpful, but we focus as much on uh, compass-based forms of understanding. As, as maps. And so what do I mean by this? Well, here are some quotes from some of these interviews that I've carried out. If you look in the background of this picture, you'll see a very keen young researcher carrying out his, his research. Um, and here are some quotes from the interviews that I transcribed from that research. So getting people to describe 
what is, it's hard work dealing with all these bureaucratic structures like, like the, the, the text that I showed you in the previous two slide screens. What is it that keeps people involved, that keeps them putting in so much effort? Why do they want to join it? People gave me responses like, oh, how can I say it? And, and, and it, the point that I've been making, that it, it can be very hard, if not impossible, to verbalise exactly what it is that draws people towards certain social groupings or why they feel called to answer environmental challenges through collective action rather than individual or participation in existing government structures. Um, somebody else said, it's sort of like swimming with the tide. And that for me, I think is a quote that I keep coming back to is there's this sense that um, you, want to, you want to do something, you want to achieve it, but it's just so much easier when you feel like you're part of a, a body, a, a social body, who are also going in the same direction as you. Somebody else described it as a knowing in your bones which again is a way of trying to get a gesture towards a form of understanding that isn't limited by words or language. And, and the last one is it's about complementing these different types of knowledges. So this person said it's the doing, it's the head, the heart and the hand. So I'm not trying to set up a straw man and say head-based, objectified, map-based types of understanding are to be done away with, but rather to say complementing this with them with this more experiential um, embodied forms of belonging to and with other people that I'm calling orientation, that's a shorthand here, um, I think is a much needed perspective that we need going forward for research on these, on these groups. Okay, so just to, to kind of list uh, in bullet points the benefits as I see it for orientation, I think it pays attention to groups on their own terms, not ascribing language or a role to these initiatives, but it allows them to speak as much as, as, much as possible, speak and act um, as they are uh, as they're doing what, what, whatever it does. And again, the point, as I was going through different um, uh, uh, previews of this to, to myself, I was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to be too down on the map. So complimenting the map was something I was keen to, to hammer home. Um, and it allows an insight. I think this is something that I want to, to fully, I want to more fully think through, but it allows an insight into the numinous. So this very um, uncertain perspective. And I think this is something that I know Antonio is, is publishing some work on and that he also mentioned a paper we published last year uh, on the role of meditation. So surprisingly, two research projects, me and a colleague went into, not at all thinking about studying meditation, but it came out that these community group members regularly reported engaging in collective mind-body practices from yoga to meditation to a whole range of other um, practices of, of mindfulness. That I think that's really interesting. What is going on there? That these types of perspectives that are so regularly seen as being individualized, so retreating into the self or taking time to to peace out and to, to gather mental fortitude to get you through the day or however people use these types of practices. This, this is way beyond my area of expertise. Um, it seems to be used in a collective way for these or groups and organizations who are very outwards orientated, who are trying to affect political action on the ground in the real world. And so this disjuncture between inner and outer um, I find really fascinating. And I wonder if orientation or an orientation type perspective can allow that more that perspective to speak more than a map based map based view, and so much more theoretically, um, as I touched on before, it materializes and historicizes what can be quite um, uh, two two different set, sets of of literature on understanding theoretically what's happening in these groups. The one is is the what I've called left Heideggerian thought, and the other is the more post Marxist, and I think. I don't want to be to pl plant my flag on one side or the other, but I wonder if, if bringing these two together uh, can can help uh, both see a way forward and trying to chart okay. what is happening in these groups on the ground as they go forward. Okay, and the last point I think is in some ways uh, the starting point for me looking through these types of perspectives is its openness to the future. It's against fixity. It's against actual. Um, locatedness as a final thing. Okay, this group does this type of thing and it belongs there. It's saying, well, where are they going? There's a sense of movement and flow and an openness to the future, which uh, 
as I said, I don't want to be normative about it, but where they go is really open. Um, and uh, we've seen in this particular very narrow field in the last few years, whole other expressions of environmental community-based action emerging, like Extinction Rebellion, and then obviously the pandemic's hit and that's on the back burner for a bit. Who knows what's going to ha happen next? And I think as researchers of this and even participants in the group, we need to be open to possibilities. And so uh, not fixing where these particular initiatives exist, I think is going to be uh, very important going forward. Okay, so uh, I think that's the end of my time. I hope I've not gone over uh, by too much. And uh, I would be delighted to uh, continue the conversation. It's a shame we can't meet in person to talk about these ideas. But uh, there we are.